It's been two years almost, and actually I thought it's it's a longer time since the release, but um, we played a lot of shows, um, like one full club tour, two acoustic tours, a lot of festivals everywhere. Um, we've been like reorganizing ourselves. We got rid of the studio projects and everything and made everything a lot simple, uh, simpler than before. And we were actually like uh, working in many, many studios, like writing songs from LA, Paris, Stockholm to Tokyo, Finland, everywhere, like traveling and enjoying the ride. I mean, the time taking time off and stuff as well. But we actually started recording the new album already 14 months ago, like for real. So it's been a busy two years, but it feels amazingly good. I don't know why. I'm not that tired. I am tired today because we mastered the album last night, but. I don't feel tired, tired with the thing. The title of the album is Out of Style. That's who we are. It's, uh, the album title is, is always a little bit, well, sometimes you have a, like a straight answer for it. Like on the first one we had On the Way to Wonderland, which was one of the tracks, and that kind of described the, the journey we were uh, making that time. And on the second one, Popgasm just sounded so cool that we had to name it Popgasm. This time we had a lot of different choices. There was like a lot of suggestions from the record company people and from publishers and stuff. But um, out of style is just something that we are musically and also with our looks. Because we're not like, you know, rock stars. We're not either like Pet Shop Boys and we're not like Keith Urban, like, you know, Telecaster country kind of a Nashville thing. And also in the music, it goes the same way. We play pretty hard stuff sometimes, but there's some pretty poppy th elements in the thing. So out of style, we are. It's from one of the songs. And I was driving again in my German car in Helsinki last summer. And I was listening to the demo version, raw mix uh, of a song called Sex and Cigarettes. And then I sing there, cause I'm out of style. I was like, yeah, I'm out of style. <laughs> That's the whole thing, and, you know. We have no style, so I don't know if uh, the fans come to our shows and listen to our music because of the style that we don't have. But probably that is like something about Sunrise Avenue that is real true, because we are what we are, as you see. Uh, there's no <laughs> huge image plan behind these guys. And the same goes with music. We just play whatever we feel like playing. There's no genre or anything or style that we stick to. We do what we want to do. and. Yeah, it's like, it's good and it's bad. It's real and it's true what we are. And probably sometimes it's a li little bit difficult for the promoter or for the agent to, you know, get us to the festival or get us to the radio, whatever, uh, because we're out of style. We used two different producers. Um, we were really happy that uh, our record companies told us that we can actually have free hands uh, being the executive producers of the album. And we had two guys, Jukka Baklund, who did already two albums for us. And also another Jukka <laughs> from Finland, Jukka Immonen. He, um, he's really, really hot in the, in the north, in Scandinavia. I mean, not temperature wise, but like on the charts. And I just gave him a call like in April, May, somewhere. Could, you, could he do like a track or two or three with us? And, um, yeah, it felt like the right thing from the very beginning. We did a track called Hollywood Hills with him. That's how we started. And I just felt that there's something that, you know, we should continue. But yeah, and you know, I was the executive producer myself, uh, which is really nice in a way, because there was no, you know, suit people in the studio, like talking about the snare sound or the guitar sound or which song goes on the album, which doesn't. Now it's exactly the way the band wants it. And that's, that's a good thing. I was in LA um, last spring, 2010, for uh, some three weeks. EMI Germany sent me there to meet some new songwriters, and it was a really fun trip. I mean, there were people who wrote like uh, the Bodyguard soundtrack and 
Pink albums and Avril Lavigne, Bon Jovi, whatever stuff like that. So uh, I was pretty nervous actually, and it was really hard work. Like from morning, you wake up. Well, sometimes you just went to the pool, but don't tell that to anybody. And but usually went to the studio, like drove a long way to Studio Hills or whatever, like around LA, and. We made some pretty good songs. None of the co-write session songs ended up on the album, but on the last night, uh, I was really, really tired. I was a little bit um, uh, drunk, not drunk, drunk, but you know, after a little party, and I was really exhausted. I just wanted to go home the next morning, and I came back to my room with my guitar, and I just saw the the Hollywood Hills, you know, the little hills that, were, you know, Hollywood Hills, <laughs> Jesus, anyway. And I just said like, bye bye Hollywood Hills. And then there was this melody that started ringing in my head. I was like, okay, I'll just take the guitar one more time. And I recorded the demo in five minutes on my laptop. And I didn't think about it that much actually then. Then I came home with all the songs that I got from the co-write sessions and from the producers. And I still kept going back to the Hollywood Hills thing. And then I really like wrote the lyrics as they are today. And then I played it to the guys and the guys were like, hey, let's do this one. And then the producer, the new, New Yuka also said that hey, there's, there's really something like probably radio potential and would be probably a nice live song because it's pretty rocky and whatever. And here we are. Yeah, I hope that people in LA or in states could listen to it, but um, you know you have to talk to the the business people <laughs> about that thing. But I don't know. It's uh, everybody in the world knows what Hollywood is. Everybody gets some sort of an image in their heads, you know, when, when you say the word Hollywood. Um, you know, it would be cool. Never know. I like LA. I think it's the coolest city in the US that I've been to. I've been to the Eastern Coast more, playing ice hockey, for example. Um, not that successfully, though. But. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, there's this kind of a European mood in the city. There's a lot of like people from different countries and I think half of the people are from somewhere else. And the weather is not that bad, to be honest, but um, I don't know. I, I still like Europe a bit more. I'm European, but it's, it's a cool place to visit and I can recommend it warmly to anybody. All the songs on the album are very personal, but um, I think probably, uh, well, they're all. I mean, even even Hollywood Hills is a pretty, I was feeling super lonely and I was like, it's a love story inside the, inside the Hollywood Los Angeles city map thing, you know? Um, but I don't know, there's like, probably Somebody Help Me, which is a song about how you can get really, really scary emotions when you really fall for something or for, or for, for somebody. Or maybe Sweet Symphony in the very end is about like how lost you are in your life and you don't know what to do. But I don't write anything that specific in the songs because I don't want people to know my real, you know, uh, real insight. But yeah, they're all really, really personal, every one of them. Of course, I think the biggest uh, dream or the the challenge we have is that we would really like to keep on doing this. And you know, not every album sells a lot and maybe there's no hits from every album and maybe there's not a hit ever again, but the biggest thing would be to be able to, you know, play together with these guys and have a few people at least in the audience because I don't know, I've tried a few things in my life, but you can't get the same kind of a good feeling from anything else than, you know, playing with your own team and then enjoying an evening together with the people. So yeah, I don't know, but of course, I mean, they asked me in an interview like two days ago, would you be prouder of the band and yourself when you can call yourself the million album club, you know? It's like, that all depends so much on luck and you know the people who work with you and how the winds blow when you record the if there you know so it's a it's a bigger thing to keep on doing this and you know i hope i keep can keep on singing
I think we visited Germany more than anything, even more than Finland, <laughs> the last five years. But but it's super cool and it's a big country. There's like, you know, in Scandinavia, like in Sweden or Finland, you have the one big capital where everything is built around. But what is really cool about Germany, there's like, like let's say ten big cities, like and it, they differ so much from Leipzig to Hamburg to Cologne to Frankfurt, whatever. And uh, there's a lot of clubs and a lot of festivals where you can go to. I think the German-speaking part of the world is that's our home base. I have to say that it does feel like home when we come to Germany. Uh, the German people are not that far from the Finnish uh, folks. There's this same kind of a mentality thing. We are a bit too, uh, a bit more shy in the north, and we're a little bit uh, more jealous, probably at least with you know the music or whatever. If you're an athlete in Finland, everybody talks bad about you if it's not the you know your favorite team or, or whatever. But um, yeah, it's everything works really well here. It's like you can go to Krankhaus and you get the the paracetamol <laughs> the same way you get in the north. Um, you know the taxi drivers don't rape you at least not yet. Hopefully not even in the future. Uh, oh, and um, yeah, and it's like uh, people are like pretty genuine. They're really pretty real. They seem to be what they really are compared to some other areas of the world. Yeah, so it feels like home and it's been my uh, project for a few <laughs> years already to get a get a flat from here, but I've been a little bit busy. The first thing that makes me smile when I think about Germany is the live audiences. I, I have to say the best shows are here because First of all, the crowd is always really, really good. That also happens like in Greece or Poland, Russia, whatever. The second really big thing is that everything works like a German car every time. If it's in the rider that there is a black cable going to this console, to this guitar, it's always there. That's huge. I mean, you never have problems because in like even in Finland, you can have like there's like this 20 minutes to the show time and no, no, was there supposed to be uh, whatever there? So that never happens in Germany. And uh, the third thing is, you know, like now that I'm thinking about the tour, we started in Finland in March 2011 and March Finland is not that warm yet. And we come to Germany in April and I'm expecting a nice spring. I remember the first very first tour we did, it was uh, in early March and it was, I remember, behind Ewerk in Cologne, it was 23 degrees and it was sun, sun was shining. I was like, this is where I want to be. Our fan club or our fan clubs are uh, very, very active in Germany also. And I think they're the most active. Uh, I don't actually even know how it works because it's like a big family. There's like the official fan club. There's, I think the baby tigers are from Austria and the bees are from there and the frogs are from there. There's team Ars Crocodile, which is obviously uh, going strong. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's super cool. Like um, you understand that you have a fan club or so when you're like on the top of the charts and like everybody's talking about you. That's when it's kind of natural. But what has been a really big surprise for us and made us feel really, really good is that, you know, when there's been these like downhills with the band and these harder times, these people don't leave you. They keep pushing and they keep like cheering you up and they come to the show. So they are doing a better job than I ever thought. I mean, I thought I was a good fan for Bon Jovi and for my favorite ice hockey team, but I have a lot to learn from these people. Hoffentlich, we will be uh, playing a lot of festivals also uh, next summer. We don't know, but I'm sure there will be some, uh, hopefully also in Germany. And uh, yeah, there's a tiny club tour, like uh, I think it's 10 shows around there or a little bit less in uh, April. I should know the dates, I know, late April. And if everything goes well and people still want to hear us and see the show, we'll do another one closer to Christmas or something like that.
Liechtenstein has always been like the one of the <laughs> targets for us, but uh, we can settle for San Marino. No, there's like, I don't know how many countries we've been to, um, uh, but I don't know. I mean, it's a huge thing that a band from Finland can actually like fly over to Berlin, for example, and play a show here or to Athens or to Tokyo, whatever. And of course, we are really happy to visit new places. But, you know, if we can keep on doing this, we are more than happy. That I get the stress out of my head. I'm waiting for the moment when the album is out. It's weird because it's like we finished it actually last night. It was like approved, approved, approved. And uh, everything is perfect now, not perfect, but everything is the way we want it. And I was thinking about it two weeks ago. I thought like this time it'll be really easy because I feel so good about the album uh, that maybe I don't get the new album panic stress kind of thing at all. And two days ago it like hit me like a hammer. And it was like, you know, I listened to the whole thing through and I was like, oh my, this sounds so crappy. It's like, oh, we picked that guitars or whatever. So I don't know. But I'm, I hope there's a lot to do before the release, like videos, interviews, whatever, shows, like whatever, to uh, keep us busy because it's a little bit of a bad times, you know, waiting. Because you want to you wanna have the reactions from the people, how they like it. And even though we feel really sure about it and we like it very much, you get these moments sometimes, you know, you have a little hangover or you're a little bit tired or whatever. And then you're like, oh my God, is it really that good actually after all? So I'm just waiting for the album to be released. Then I can breathe. We have had a pretty nice journey. I mean, we released the first album 2006. Um, to name a highlight from there is pretty tough because uh, there's been like, you know, ups and downs. The beginning wasn't easy at all. And uh, then we, well, took off, it went well. Then there was like ups and downs. But I, I would have to say that when we had our first tour outside Finland, I had this funny, really funny feeling that actually I'm not in my country at the moment. These people have really paid the tickets and they have really come to the show, like on a Tuesday evening, it's raining and stuff. So they are really, really like, it's our show. It's like we are the, well, it was like 400 people or whatever, but it's still a lot. And that's where it felt like that this could actually work. This can, I mean, it was already pretty okay doing on the radio and uh, the TV video charts and stuff like that. But that it really, 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 really works on stage. That was, uh, I don't know, it felt really good and felt like promising. I hope 2011 would be, I hope that we could be, um, we could play a lot of shows, of course, because we really, that's like the biggest thing with the new album. We want to go to the people and perform the songs and, you know, sing them together with, uh, with the people in the audience. Mm, I, I am pretty hopeful that there will be time for going to gym and enjoying the summer again and like, uh, but I think it's it's a little bit easier mentally for us this time because it's not the second album curse we have on us and we realize that even on a on a harder time that we had on the second album it still went pretty all right so there's you don't sense any panic around anybody actually at the moment and you know I hope that we can travel a lot play a lot of shows and we stay healthy and remember to take it easy. Let life take you wherever it takes. That's the best plan. And be a good boy on the way. Hollywood Hills um, was the track that kind of like... Um, gave us the direction for the whole album it it like I felt confident again writing simple songs that are not like too artistic and stuff and just based on a feeling and the drive in the song and I felt really really good when I heard it last summer like 2010 uh, after the first studio session I felt okay now we're back on track I, I had missed that in Sunrise Avenue for quite some time and um, 
it's a cool thing. It's it's a cool thought that actually they sent me to Los Angeles to ride with all these people and then being super tired, like crushed, being homesick, like almost crying, you write this song that ends up being the first single. I'm not saying it's any better than the other songs. I just felt so much more close to it, probably because of the moment when it happened and stuff. But um, and I'm super happy uh, that that track also brought us together with the new producer, Jukka Immonen who is now really close to the band also. I mean, he produced half of the album. So um, he his uh, style is to put the band involved a lot, like let Sami play drums for an hour or two and just to see if there's something that he could use or whatever. It's not about making a plan before you go to studio. It's about like letting it happen the way it comes out. I'm super happy with the track and that, I have to say, um, gave me a lot of strength that track like made me believe in the whole thing again uh, when it, it was pretty difficult in like april may june but that opened the doors again and i thought that yeah this can really work damn silence is something it's a weird song because riku had the something from the verse some things from the verse written like long time ago years ago and he played it to me two years ago and we tried to finish the song like uh, a long time ago it just didn't work there was something really wrong and however we decided to this we did with Yuka Baklund our like in-house producer who's been with us for years and we recorded drums and stuff for the song in Porvo, away from Helsinki, in this little cabin in Finland. And uh, still I didn't feel that it's right or whatever. And I was in Paris now in September 2010. And we had finished a lot of songs with Jukka already, uh, with the producer. He lives there now. And then we had a pizza one evening and some, you know, red wine and whatever. And he said, like, it's still bothering me, this song. Could we try something the way it's now, like this? side chain compressor kind of a dance thing in a way but it's still this mixture of like pretty hard guitars and a lot of electronic stuff i was like yeah what do we have to lose we have one more day so let's just give it a shot if it doesn't work let's go out somewhere and <clears throat> i didn't have any lyrics for the song that time nothing was there and we just made a quick demo in five minutes we were both like switched on and then we didn't leave the room for the next 15 hours we just like finished the song right away it's super cool it's one of my favorites because that's completely something new that we never did but it still sounds like sunrise avenue super happy somebody help me is a song about um you know it's really hard to to write lyrics for a love song like you know rock sets they already did listen to your heart bon jovi already did bed of roses and there's a couple more in the world um love songs i mean but um this song is about uh, how scary it actually is to fall in love i mean you really fall for the person or for whatever animal what you people fall in love with uh, and it, it's the greatest thing in the world of course especially if you feel that you're getting some uh, some response to your feelings but uh, then you get a little bit scared probably that you know what if this is just for the moment or whatever it there's this scary side but i think when you fall in love you just have to let go and just follow your feeling and your you know the whole the mo just like live the moment but uh, i don't know then you can feel that it's a bit scary and you know somebody help me where where is this thing going i think that's that's cool I uh, I played it to Yuka Buckland also. I played it at my home, actually on my sofa, and he said like, "Yep, let's do it." But he, I think he did a really good job with the production as well because uh, I think it would have been super boring with the typical Mötley Crüe rock band, like Bed of Roses kind of a production. It's 2011 still, and Yuka wanted to try something really, really uh, different, even though some people had like these kind of faces when we played it for the first time but there's something really unique and something really good there and I wanted to have it as the third track on the album just to show that there's a lot of different styles in the album but they still sound the same it's absolutely one of my favorites it's like a German car on a dark road in Finland somewhere with the volume 
as loud as it goes. It's a perfect thing. I don't dance. I don't dance. I was in, uh, in Switzerland, in Verbier. There's a skiing center last winter for three weeks or two weeks. Was it for three weeks? For a few weeks anyway. And um, I was sitting in this ski lift, whatever you call it, where you sit with your snowboard. I started snowboarding. I always went with skis, but now I had to, because it's cooler, because I'm getting older, I have to try something. <laughs> now it's more fun. Um, and I was sitting in a ski lift and I had this like weird like beat in my head. And I just like thought about the whole disco dancing thing. And you know, I don't, I really don't dance. I hate dancing. And I just started seeing the thing in the ski lift. And then I went to the cabin. I mean, I didn't think about it <clears throat> the next day or the following. Then it came back to me, it came back to me. So I sang a demo in the, in the cabin where we stayed, in the whole, the damn house that we had rented. And I came home, I forgot the track for like, I don't know, for a half a year. And I just like played it to the, to the new Jukka, the new producer. He's like, yeah, let's do this. So we rewrote it a little bit and even rewrote the lyrics a, a little bit with him. And uh, I don't know, there was something a little bit weird when we pl first played it in studio. But everybody had this like, yeah, feeling about it. So, and that was so hard. It was last night, actually last night we were mastering the album. That was a really difficult track because it's so different in a way. It's like a more pumping sound in the, especially in the chorus, but they made it perfect. We have a really good, I hope it's uh, gonna be a single someday because I have the coolest uh, video idea for that, which, you know, might have something to do with <laughs> dancing. But I, th I think that's something pretty fresh and um, it's, uh, that's also a song that, that uh, comes from the world that I've been missing with Sunrise Avenue a little bit. From the kind of a first album world, but still something very new. I gotta go. That is also a very, very, uh, actually an old track. I wrote it, to, I was supposed to be on the second album. I would have wanted to have it there. Um, and it, we almost skipped it three months ago. We almost let it go, but then Riku had a perversion with the song and he was like pushing and pushing and pushing and like we have to do it. And I was never happy with the chorus and Riku had a really good idea how to solve the melody thing there. I still wasn't happy with it and there was like a lot of battle and fighting and I said that it's too, it was still too like, you know, 70s rock or whatever. Uh, but then uh, Jukka Immonen, the new Jukka producer, he had a pretty cool twist to the verses, so it didn't get that like rock and roll. And yeah, we got it working. And it's like, it w that song was a wild card till the very, very end. And I, was, I just decided that when we hear the final results, let's decide if we use it or not. That is probably the rockiest song we ever did, even rockier than Choose to Be Me or whatever. It's like really this kind of an American uh, modern electronic rock, but a really rock band thing. But when, when I heard the final thing came from Jesse, the mixing engineer, I was like, hands up, this is what we want to do on stage. It goes fast and it, it's the fast, I think the tempo is like 179, which is like super. Um, we used to play it at our old, old rehearsal place and we always loved playing the song. It's there's so much energy in it. And I even played it to, uh, in my car, a raw version to Daniel from EMI. And he said that there was no vocals. Nobody was singing in the song. And he was like, there's something really good in the song. I was like, ah, I know, but it doesn't work. So yeah, but I gotta go out of my way. Can't wait to do that one on, uh, on stage. Stormy End is, uh, I wrote the song like pretty late, like, I think in August 2010, September or something. And I really, really liked something about it. I wasn't that sure, but then I took it to Jukka Immonen, and the producer. Um, I played it to him and I wasn't really sure. I wanted this, some, this is one of the tracks that I just wanted to like play to somebody else and like see what they think about it. And he really liked it. We decided to 
try some it's really simple so that's the danger in that song it's like it can get really boring if you don't like get a nice production sound and an angle to the whole thing and um i wasn't actually i was like that was a maybe song for me all the way until the i until i heard the final mix the record company people really liked it and everybody was saying yeah, that can be a really big song it's a nice song on stage and i was like yeah let's let's see let's see let's see i mean usually when they say that you're like yes they like it but i mean i just wanted to be sure um that song is about when a relationship ends with two people or whatever like your employer whatever but um when two people they split apart it's about like first there's a storm and you know then there's a you know the stormy end and when you're over the stormy end things start looking a little bit better soon that i wrote in a sauna actually i was naked when that melody hit me it's a cool thing i was in uh, lammi it's in finland like this little lake where we were together with my uh, well my friend my management representative Mikko Saukkonen and we were dri- driving these jet skis whatever you call them and we were like water skiing and stuff and i just had this melody like ringing in my head again <laughs> it happens in weird places and i had to run to the cabin to take my iphone paid commercial and uh, i sang the melody there and then we were there for a week like just hanging out in the summer and stuff I think it was August and I, it's, the song just got better and better so I had like 50 different versions of the song on my phone so when I went home I finished it but yeah I wrote that naked in a sauna so I should probably hang out more with naked people you know you do you go to sauna naked in Finland not like you do that in Germany too yeah yeah but you know that yeah anyways but yeah I wrote that naked and it's a, a sensitive song oops Kiss Goodbye is a, <clears throat> we started actually, that started as a co-write writing session with Jukka Baklund, the producer. We just started um, playing with some chords and uh, decided to do something a little bit different than we always do. Like just trying new, well, it, they're still the same chords that we always use. I mean, always use, but I mean, it's nothing that special and new. But we wanted to find something new that would feel fresh to us as well, like not the same drum loop or not the same like band rock band start, uh, not too slow, not too fast, somewhere in the mid tempo. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to have like this story about like breaking up. I'm breaking up a lot in the songs, breaking up with somebody, but doing it with a <clears throat> with a with a with good intentions, like leaving the, the other one feeling well as 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 well. Um, Yeah, um, that that song just happened. That wasn't supposed to go actually anywhere. We're just supposed to have fun with it. And I started liking the song a lot. Uh, it was just like, it was never the <clears throat> the highlight of the album for me. It was never the the weak part. It was just something that was always there. It was there for like almost two years. And we just felt like putting it out on this album because we loved it a lot with all the guys. And I think it will be really cool to have a song like that because it's it's pretty acoustic there's like a banjo and everything in the song and there's this positive mood on it so it's i think it's a good flavor in the middle of the album it fits there perfectly sex and cigarettes <clears throat> this was a big big workload especially for me because um, i had this song already a year ago pretty much there And uh, then Jukka Baklund wanted to write a new chorus for it, uh, which is nice, kind of, but I never liked it. And we have it had the song with a different chorus, artistic, this kind of a big symphony, whatever, like Nick Kershaw thing. And I never felt like I was home with that that song. And I felt so bad because I really liked the verse, like the bad girls want to have the thing. And I think it took the song the, to a wrong direction. And then finally, in August last year, I was begging Yuko, can we please go back to my original chorus and the original song? And Yuko, with, with his big heart, he came to the studio, recorded the drums and the guitars and the guys. We just played it like late at night somewhere in the forests of Finland. And I was so happy again. And we finished it in, in Paris um, with him the same time we did uh, Damn Silence and, and some other songs. And uh, yeah, it's something like, uh, you know, it's a story about how I'm without a girl 
and I can't get anybody because I'm either too out of style or, you know, the fashion girls want to have like the cool guys or bad girls want to have the sex and cigarettes guys and I'm not one of them. And there is a good message in the C part for anybody who wants to be with somebody there. Well, just check it out. The wish list part. The right one. That is a song that was supposed to be on Popgasm already. Uh, it almost got there. I'm actually happy that it's not because it's good to have it now. Then we gave it a little time and it grew up a little bit. Um, <clears throat> we tried that song. I mean, that song started at the rehearsal place. Rico was playing like de -de 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 this riff, and I was like, "What are you doing there? Can you do it again?" And then, like, then we built the whole song around that, like, in a second. Um, we first made a band demo of it. Nobody liked it, but us, we liked it a lot. Then there was another producer who made it, and yeah, people kind of liked it, but we were really, really excited about it. And then we had to go back to good old Jukka Baklund, and he made a perfect uh, band arrangement for the song. I think it's really cool. It reminded me of the what's the the pretty big hit from the UK guys, Chasing Cars. That's the same kind of a attention from the, in the song all the time. But I have to admit that like one night when the whole song was already mixed and done, we went to my home with Riku secretly and we played some more guitars in the end because it wasn't rocky enough in the end. I wanted to be bigger. And also Osmo, uh, we were touring in Germany, we were in Recklinghausen. And at the backstage I just told Osmo to br play some uh, some organs, like some kind of a, like rock organs to the song. And we secretly added uh, those organs and also some backing vocals and guitars to the end of the song without telling Mr. Buckland anything. And actually he will hear them on the album. He never heard anything about the, my backing vocals or anything. It wasn't ready. I felt that it needed something more, so we took it in our own hands. And the right one, the title is... Uh, Sometimes you feel that, you know, there's really something special about you and somebody else and there's a real, real connection. So I don't believe in that there's the right one for you that you're going to spend the rest of your life with. It can happen and it's the sweetest thing if it happens. But, you know, <clears throat> there can probably be many of the right ones. I'm not talking like Vince Neil from Mötley Crue that you're going to have 15 right ones same night. But uh, why did I say that? But the... Uh, anyway, it's something that you should value if you find a person you really like. Out of Tune <laughs> is a... That's the strange track on this album. We were driving with a bus from Athens to Patra or Thessaloniki in Greece to a festival. I don't remember which town. and. I was really on a songwriting mood. I had the guitars and stuff in the bus and I was like running around the bus like playing all the new super great ideas that I thought I have. And then <coughs> Osmo came to the back back seat of the bus with me and he was like, yeah, that's cool. I was playing a... I always wanted to do a song like that. And I think we wrote like four or five songs during that trip. It's like 200 kilometers. It's like a lot of stuff. And Out of Tune was definitely the best one of them. I wrote the lyrics like in three minutes. It was, it's, that's a song about like being too wasted or drunk or whatever uh, to handle a situation. And Rico was there also like, uh, it was like a mess. Everybody was like, yeah, play G, play C, play H, play BB, whatever. Um, it's cool. I think what really made it really good is uh, Jukka in Paris because he brought in this like, because it's a real rock song, like real big drums and stuff, big guitars biggest guitars we ever had probably, but Yuka brought in some Lady Gaga feeling. <laughs> you know, pa -pa 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 -pa. And mixing those two things are, uh, it's a really cool combination. And I first thought it's a little bit too rough for Sunrise Avenue, but then we got the feedback from the record companies, from people, and everyone was like, yeah, that's something really cool. I was like, all right, maybe I'm actually liking it. This is how weak I am. Um, yeah, and I love the Yuka's vocal editing in the, in the C part. That's like, mwah. I mean, mwah. You get it? Mwah. Yeah. Angels on a Rampage. Angels, that 
was in Stockholm. I was, uh, before I went to Los Angeles, I was there for a week in Stockholm, Sweden. It's the neighbor country of Finland. They are not as good in football and ice hockey as we are, but they are okay. Um, <clears throat> I wrote the song together with the American girl, <clears throat> Sharon Wan. I think she was like Miss Texas from like 20 years ago or something. Very sweet girl. And Carl Bjursell, like a Swedish, like Swedish Jukka. <clears throat> really fast, talented, like good operator for the writing production sessions. Um, it's a really funny feeling when you do a co-write session with somebody. You sit in like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning. You have a cup of coffee. You say, hi, I'm Samu. I'm from Finland. I like ice hockey and ice cream. And yeah, you, 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 okay, let's take guitars. And then you start doing something. It's not nice every time. I mean, you know, it can feel really awkward, really like... Um, you don't feel the people the right way or they don't like your ideas, it can go the wrong direction. But this time it was like, it felt a bit weird. I mean, Sharon was like talking about her animals, something, cats or whatever they were. <laughs> That's how much I was listening. I was so nervous. And uh, they were just like talking about the studio stuff and we just ended up like having the instruments and we just like wrote the song. It just happened. And it's a good sign if a song comes out fast, if you do a co-write session. If you have to work it too much, it means that there's nothing there, really. But this just happened, and uh, I remember I, when I went back to the hotel pretty late after the session, uh, I felt so good that, okay, there's at least some people you can co-write songs with, and you can feel that they're your own. Uh, everybody liked the track. I mean, there was a lot of tracks from LA, from other writing sessions and stuff, but this was the only track people really liked in the team. and. Uh, we wanted to make it pretty pretty rocky, pretty heavy. It's like, read the chorus is really, really tough in a way. There's like even angry guitars and angry drums. It's about the angels who uh, make our love life sometimes a little bit difficult. There's really cool, uh, <clears throat> especially from Sharon, there was like really cool lyrical little points like, driving like a crazy man, yeah, without the headlights. <laughs> Sweet Symphony is, um, I don't know what happened, I had this like, it was the same weekend I wrote Somebody Help Me and Sweet Symphony and well then two other tracks that are not on the album but um, there was something that, I don't know, I had a, got a new guitar, a new acoustic guitar and it was a really beautiful spring um, afternoon, I was just playing it. Uh, just the basic chords that are there and I just felt something and I just wanted to sing about life like what what should you like how you should look at yourself and the others I mean I don't want to heal the world or anything because I'm not powerful enough or or good enough to do that even myself but um, I wanted to like you know it sounds so cheesy but I wanted to send a message to the people that I care about that if life is taking up them up or down I'm gonna be there no matter what and this is the little sweet symphony that I can you know give to them to hopefully give them something good in their days and I got really deep with the lyrics I mean even when the guys saw the text they were like you're singing about like devil and God and stuff like that here and I was like yeah actually I seem to do but I think it's it's still like, it's about how, you know, everybody, we're like every now and then we don't really know which way to go. And uh, it's good if we could stop every now and then, have we been good to ourselves and also to the others? Um, it's, uh, I don't know, that was something really, I was living an artistic month or two, or a year or two uh, in my life that time. And I got really, really deep, but I love that it's, um, it's a little bit Nashville, probably. It's a little light, but I think it's a great way to end the album and to, uh, you know, leave a little bit of question there in the end. So hopefully there will be something more someday. Hi, everybody. I am Samu from Sunrise Avenue. And I'd like to present our new album, Out of Style. Enjoy it. Hi everybody, I am Samu from Sunrise Avenue and I would like to present you our new single, Hollywood Hills. Enjoy it. 